Scrub the hidey. Dodgy? In a good way? Just a grotty little pub. A refuge for oddballs. A place for scumbags and dropouts and no hopers who play rock and roll. The carpet was ingrained with sweat, cigarettes, stale beer. The floor was sticky. The, the light was dim. It was like going into a swamp, but it was where all the indie bands and the punk bands went. Father bought it off the Swan Brewery back in 1979. My mum's uh, father and mother had several hotels in country Western Australia. And um, yeah, so it's sort of been in the blood, I suppose. My dad was in the banking game. So um, yeah, that sort of tied in pretty nicely. He had a bank holiday once where he went and ran the Newmarket Hotel in Fremantle for a few months and thought, this is for me and quit the bank and went into the pub game. The Hyde Park was like a home of yeah, the, the independent music scene in Perth, the true rock and roll scene. It was a great place for seeing just about anything and you always had a very diverse crowd that got along great. It was the sort of place where anyone was welcome, no one was being judgmental, great shows, great, a great, uh, great uh, place, unfortunately a representative of a dying breed of uh, venue as well. When I was a kid, you could go to the planet, which was turned into a strip joint, ultimately, because we needed less live original music venues and more strip joints. You could go to the Greenwich, which was junked. You could go to the Grosvenor, which has been shut down as a music venue because one bloke complained. Um, the Loft is gone. Yeah, a whole bunch of places, for, which, was, which were good for live original music, were shut down. And then you've got City of Perth councillors saying, oh, you know, why don't we have more vibrancy? Let's spend lots of money on figuring out how to solve the vibrancy issue. As opposed to, let's not close places down as music venues because one person complained, so, you know. I guess the difference there was it was more accepting. They sort of knew the individuals and they'd let you get away with things, I guess, if you could explain yourself. There was none of this zero tolerance set rules of what you can and can't do in a place that you get everywhere else. <laughs> and cheap drinks and um, you're allowed to do pretty much what you wanted. Um, no one, no other pub in town that fucked up the rats or the homicides to do what we did in that place, you know. Just started with a, a one night on a Saturday night. We thought we'd try some, you know, just some people in the bar were talking about, you know, let's try some music. So we tried a Saturday night. Um, then after a few weeks, started to pick up. So we, we, 
went and did another night on a Friday night. And then, you know, different things from there sort of sprung up. Um, and before we knew it, we were doing seven nights a week. There were all sorts of people doing all sorts of things. There were so many people involved. It was mainly about working in with Higo and coordinating who was bringing enough money in over the bar and if sometimes people, like the Hip Hop Monday didn't work for and we had to run a reggae night. So I ran a reggae night on Mondays for three years. I hated reggae at the start of it, loved it at the end. I mean, there was lots of things we tried that didn't work as well, you know? And there was things that were just, where I thought, there's no way this is gonna, this is, you know, okay, we'll have a go, but I can't see this going very far. And three years later, they're still doing the same thing on, you know, whatever night it was during the week. So, I mean, we had uh, some of the dirtiest, scungiest rock and roll in town and we had, you know, out the back there was the, what we used to call Jurassic Park, where all the old people used to dine and they had jazz and comedy and all that sort of stuff. The Hyde Park um, reminded me of um, uh, when I went to New York in 1976 and went to CBGB's and um, it, it reminded me of, of that place that was a pretty small down-to-earth club in the Bowery in Manhattan there. And I saw bands like the Ramones and Johnny Thunder's Heartbreakers and the Dictators and Blondie and Talking Heads and lots of bands that started there that played to mm, pretty much a similar crowd that, that people played to at the, at the Hyde Park Hotel. For me, um, it was a, uh, to socialise, to meet uh, fellow people that were in, interested in the, the same rock and roll I was interested in. And the Hardy was probably one of the only places in Perth that uh, you could go there. Uh, even if you didn't know the bands, even if you maybe didn't like the bands, you could still meet people and talk to them about rock and roll. And it was, that's why I went there. I think it was the fact that Steve Spensley is a booking agent. He had such a wide taste in music. I mean, he liked everything from hip hop to drum and bass right up to heavy metal. And he had a good eye for uh, what he thought was worth putting on. There wasn't, a, I don't think there was a hell of a lot of bands he'd knock back. Stay. that play I booked. I, I never let anyone sort of book a night. I know that he put on Gyroscope there when they were still called Gyroscope Sunday. Uh, Mac Pelican did tons of shows at the Hyde Park Hotel. I mean, at one point they were there almost every weekend. You know, when, I mean, in 99, 2000, 2001, there was a punk gig every Friday without fail. Uh, I guess it was pretty organic. Like the first few bands managed to get a foot in the door there. I mean, it's always very hard for punk bands to get a place to play which is why the Heidi was so great, because they'd actually let people get up and just mess up and have a terrible show and they'd have them back again. And so I guess once a couple of bands get a foot in the door, more bands start to come and they start to get more and more gigs and then the punters start to come. Most people, uh, when they absorb music, when they buy music, when they go to see it, they want it at the good level. You know, they want it to be, the bands to be tight, prepared, all that kind of stuff. Um, but good bands don't drop out of the sky. They start as crap bands and get better and better and better. And the Hardy was the place where crap bands could play and get better. jam some stuff out and people would just love it and you know that, that's a good place to do that whereas a lot of other pubs you'd really you know there was a, a certain quality control you know so any 
kid and his dog with a band sort of thing could get a go there. You know, some of the bands aren't together, but who's ever played and done anything that sort of proved themselves there because it was a very, you know, yeah, it was a very unpretentious place. You just got up and played, and if it worked, you could have another gig, you know. I mean, the sound wasn't fantastic, but that energy, you know, of a venue where you had new bands coming through that everyone wanted to at least check out whether they'd made up their mind or not. That's, it was just so exciting and it was free, so you could just go and, and uh, muck in, you know. If I found a band that I thought was good, say, um, like the Panics, for example. I started booking the Panics because I used to skate with Joe's brother. You know what I mean? It's like Kenny helping out and brothers in the band. Oh yeah, no worries. Yeah. So I put them on, and I thought they were great. And then the next second I just phone up at the venues and go, you should check these guys out. I remember going down there on a, on a Sunday after a particularly ridiculous weekend, drinking red wine at about 10 o'clock in the morning, and there's the old people um, having their sing-along club. And it, yeah, it, it, it was really cool, and we were hanging out and talking to them, and there's you know all these sort of sweet old people playing piano, and these complete nutcases drinking. <laughs> and throwing up. It was always just really weird to think where they were singing on a Sunday morning, there might have been a punk band, you know, only eight, nine hours before that doing their best, you know. It was, uh, but that's what the Heidi was, just such a, uh, a unique blend of, of different people and ages. Oh, in streets where I sleep Scenes started to grow from that pub. That's the important thing um, that that pub, I think, did. That, um, bands would start, a punk scene would revolve around that venue or there'd be like a little metal scene that would come in and no one else would give the metal bands a go. At the Heidi they'd have, okay, there's a metal night and all the metal heads would come in and it would be full for the night, you know? The Heidi at one stage was a Friday night with hip hop night running every, every Friday with obviously the likes of Downside and that's where you, you know, bands that spawned out of there like Columbus Dine, Matty B, Layla. We'd have a night on a Friday where the band epicenter was going just like they're doing a loop. You've got 45 people passing microphones, you know? And it, they, were, they were just electric, but you know, live bands, like this and that. But I think that's where Layla picked up a microphone for the first time. Manny B, all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, Clarence time. Viva la Arachnid! Yeah, viva la Arachnid, baby! The people in the power of the Arachnid! The people in the personal of the Arachnid! The people in the power of the Arachnid! The people in the personal of the Arachnid! Oh! People in the power of the Arachnid! The people in the personal of the Arachnid! The people in the power of the Arachnid! The people in the personal of the Arachnid! I'm afraid I won't live! Yeah, just won't leave me alone! Like I've been chewing up all But any band you cared to think about at Perth would have, would have played there. Yeah. I mean, I remember seeing, you know, when I think Sleepy Jackson were just sort of starting, and that room was absolutely, I mean, people standing on each other's shoulders. And Everywhere is freedom, and my TV tells me so. And I don't get my kicks in Belize, where well, they're on the radio. Wow, the people in the power who recommend the people in the person who recommend the people in the power who recommend. I see the people in the power who recommend.
I used to come back maybe a couple of times a year and play the Hyde Park. It was just a great bit of carpet for comedy. It was just, it had funniness, you know, soaked into its walls. Every time you see me, you can never be alone. You know my baby's on an airplane. We, we got together and it was just a bunch of just street urchins and just silly oddballs that got together and we, just, we were playing pool a lot and we were drinking a lot. We were just, the team of freaks. Oh, the team of freaks. <laughs> the place was just, um, Someone just just accepted us, really allowed yeah. us to drink there, and um, it was just a home for us. And that's really what it was. You know? I like the height is really rare. You know, it's kind of bohemian meets, you know, meets trendy. But it's, 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 it's a melting pot of all of all things of music and comedy. And... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of like the Cheers bar, um, <laughs> but a bit more Perth. Anytime you wanted to get high, you just went to the men's toilets and there was an old man there always sharing his weed around. There was, I think we all know who that was. Captain Beardo, I think everyone called him. Gan yeah. Gandalf. Like, people would pass out in the bathroom because he'd pass the, the joint on to whoever's there and offer it, and the most people, yeah, sure. And uh, <laughs> they would, you know, really make it out of the bar, <laughs> like, find the door again. <laughs> From the first time I ever went there, he was there. He was always at the back of the bar. And I swear to God, he must have cobweb, cobwebs between his face and the wall. He never left that spot of the bar. And it was just like, he never spoke either. People would talk to him and he'd just go, oh, yeah. And they're like, you're playing your gig and you'd hear this scream at the bagger. <laughs> like, who was that? It was Roger. They sat there for a good solid 10 years in the same spot. Just mm -hmm. in terms of Melbourne, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Joy used to just fill a bucket and just go, there we go. There was a keychain lady. Mm -hmm. Which was really great. Do you remember Keychain Lady? We were playing a gig and um, this woman just sort of gets up during one of our songs and she had this giant chain of keys. And there's always that lady dancing. Who was that? Uh, doing the twirling. Yeah. Oh no. And that's, a, that's a guy. That's a, that's no, a, it was a woman. No, 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 that's a guy. There's a, there's a guy with a keychain. No, and she did this dance. Like, uh, there was a woman that did a dance. Yeah, and there no, was and a she woman who did a dance. She didn't have the big. She didn't have the big ring though. That was a, that was a guy. I spent half my time at the Heidi, more so in the car park. I think as everyone did, swinging around a goon bag, I guess, and uh, sharing ciggies and so forth. Probably more time in the Heidi car park than in the Heidi. Sometimes we'd go there with a bag of goon, something like that, hide it in the bushes. But then we'd stay and spend, end up spending half the night out there. They call me Jesus Christ. Water, they call me Jesus Christ. Water, they call me Jesus Christ. Water. The new port cropping in the mouth was pretty weird. But when you saw Mary masturbating with her rosary, Heidi was, well, for people who never been there and who ended up getting a show there, it, it, it was a bit of a shock, I guess. I, it's a punk kind of institution and it's very much a northern suburbs thing. Um, I came from Fremantle and, um, and I remember the first time we went to the Heidi and we were just like, going, where's the fucking stage? <laughs> always played naked to the point where it's like somebody asked him once why he played naked it was just like uh, well no one touches me because <laughs> <laughs> you got all these puns going absolutely flying everywhere that would go nowhere near that man's house they used to say that um it was the ultimate test of whether your band was any good if you could pull off the Heidi. Still, you had to be able to um, relate to people face to face. So some bands that's easier for, and especially punk bands, you get that kind of crowd interaction. Um, there's nothing quite like it. If you played most other places, you got a decent sound check and a decent sound system, but the Heidi was pretty much all on feel. So as a vocalist, for example, I got no foldback that ever worked, and I'd pretty much have to put my foot on a certain floorboard that I'd found that vibrated in time with the kick drum and that was how I'd keep up with where I was in the song. There was no bounces so we would have to stand up for ourselves, um, like pull 40 year old men apart. <laughs> Jesus Christ. 
Joy who would just put everyone in their place it was great. Was, Good on you, love. No, fuck off. <laughs> like, if you don't like it in this bar, out. <sighs> and then she'd just walk off and then smile. <laughs> that sweet smile of satisfaction. The, the audience would actually interact with the bands. And so whether they were alcoholics, um, drunks, or mentally ill, or <laughs> a combination of mental illness and alcoholism, they would come onto the stage, what stage? And, and so because there was this leveler of having uh, the, the audience and the band being on the carpet and nothing separating them, um, it seemingly meant that people felt as though they could come onto the stage, into the space, and it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, we had people coming on stage and trying to play harmonica with us, you know, mm. I mean, you know, because we're a bunch of soft cocks, like, you know, of course we're not going to, you know, tell people to get off stage, you know, so we just kind of bent didn't, over and took it, you know. Didn't we have good one? Harmonicizing. Didn't, um, didn't we have one time where a guy came up and started playing drums for us? Probably. Yeah, actually, yeah, that's yeah. right. Some guy came up and played drums for us once. <laughs> I think I was about 14. That was a skinhead gig and it was fun. I mean, uh, in um, like about the second song, the crowd's jumping around and um, someone runs up and punches the singer in the nose, breaks his nose, and he just kept going. And I was only a little kid and I went, fuck, this is a punk rock sort of I first started going to see the Heidi when I was probably 23. I went there with my first girlfriend, Kelly, and uh, it was a Wednesday night. And uh, I walked in, and it was like walking into the Wild West, and uh, everyone looked terrifying. Um, and the rats were on stage, and that was Donnie from the Homicides, and uh, blew me away. I was in awe. It was uh, something I wanted to run from, but you were so drawn to. And um, I was pretty much hooked from that moment. Don will say that, you know, I just sort of fell in it, but he sort of recruited me. He, he saw me play in The Strange Ends. He says he hates my band, but we rocked. And uh, basically he asked me if I want to sing in a band with him. Do you remember the dose? Oh yeah. Fuck. I remember we played the amplifier a lot. I don't know how that happened, but we ended up playing amplifier a lot. And it got to the point where we'd walk off stage and as, as, as we're walking off stage, the bouncer was like, right, out. Every gig we played, we'd be allowed to play, but um, kicked out of certain things. We like grab the microphone and go, no, nothing planned, we never planned it. And boom, that's it, and the set Don's unconscious. We got banned from all these places and it's like we did less 
crazy stuff at, at any other venue than we did at the Heidi. We, mm. we could do anything. Anything. I mean, it was literally... How many times did you jump on the bar? It was we jumping on the bar, drinking out of the taps. <laughs> thing with punk when people want to get up and slam dance and drink but um, it's more of an outlet it's not really um, like actual people wanting to be violent and hurt each other because they're all friends and they're all kind of keeping an eye out on each other while they're doing that. It's not quite anything that exciting anymore. You know, we kind of have to steady yourself because you don't want to get bowled over at a gig. <laughs> it was always like that. It was always just chaos. Favourite night was when we were playing the pool room for, you know, a double stage or something. We were playing the pool room and after about one song, the crowd pulled all the lights out of the ceiling and so forth. And I, didn't, I didn't know these guys. No one knew who these people were. I think they were just kind of walking along Heard some rowdy music, saw a bunch of drunk people inside, went, oh yeah, fuck yeah, have a bit of this, go in. And then these dudes start pulling down the um, pool lights. And um, so it was pitch black, but uh, Bugsy and Johnny jump off the, well not the stage, but off the floor and start punching people in the crowd. And, and people in the crowd started punching us and it would end up in an all-in brawl in the dark. Graham had grabbed Ant because like, or grabbed someone because he thought they'd been tearing down lights and then Ant grabbed him by his mullet. And um, there's electricity, you know, floating around, like exposed um, wires and so forth. Oh, there's some dudes like having an argument over here, there's these idiots over here pulling down lights, there's these people pogoing like half a few inches away from live wires, like. And then the manager comes up and apologises and goes, oh, sorry for that. It wasn't him who pulled the lights down, you know. And um, he goes, oh, did you, could, you, could you guys keep playing? I was like, yeah, fucking up, man. And really, to be honest, like, you know, other than when we played there and the place caught on fire, like, nothing is really... Nothing really went wrong. There was this really, really dodgy dryer in the kitchen where all the tea towels would go, and if it didn't get cleaned out all the time, like, there would just be this amazing, ridiculous ball of lint and, um, anyway, caught on fire. We heard a commotion from out the back and there was this weird smell. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't, didn't really seem like the place was actually on fire. We just thought they were overreacting a bit. I was mixing Spenders at the time, um, the local band, and they uh, were pretty stubborn, or you know, lovely people but quite stubborn on the fact that they didn't get to play their whole set in the way that it was sort of like, can we have one more? And I was like, well, the kitchen's on fire, the building, you know, might catch fire. Don't you value your equipment, you might want to get out, you know. We just wanted to finish it off. Mm. Mm. It was probably safe to get everyone out. I think the laundry was on fire. It's kind of surprising that a bigger fire hasn't happened mm. there earlier, mm. to be quite honest. I've been performing around Perth and kind of Australia for about eight years now, doing my strange little electronic cabaret kind of a disco party explosion freak out kind of thing. I think I just started playing punk shows because I um like the the energy of my show as a solo performer is like like it's like I sometimes tell people it's like a punk rock show and a gay disco. The party is unfolding. I was really inspired by some, like some of the bands that I was seeing, like, um, and, and that I ended up playing with a lot. Like, I mean, yeah, the Homicides and Fear of Comedy and Project Mayhem and ZX Becky and Surprise Sex Attack and all these kind of dudes that would just put on these like really fucked up shows, and and like with a kind of showmanship that was just a bit more interesting to me than like standing behind a keyboard and pressing a button.
and, and for some reason, like, the punks kind of just, I could play to them and that was cool. Like, they, they, they would hate it at first for the first three songs and then by the end of things, it would be kind of okay because I'd been, although they may have considered the music to be shithouse, I'd been more punk rock than anyone else on the night and it was okay. You know, the Heidi allows you to do things that no other place did. I agree. You know, I don't think the homicides could have existed if, um, not if true. Heidi did not. No, if, we were banned from everywhere. decided that the homicides were Nazis and word had filtered back to the crew back over here that the homicides were Nazis and then some of those guys were like oh you know this uh, Johnny Ajax is he a Nazi and I'm like that's fucking ridiculous you know I don't think the room was full of Nazis be you know because the homicides were you know if the homicides are going like this you know and it's not it's pretty vague anyway in terms of is that you know or that you know that's that's revolution <laughs> I mean, it's a, the song's called I Hate You, you know? Um, we're a punk rock band. We're meant to offend, aren't we? It's basically the same way, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but like Sid Vicious or the Ramones is. It's just obnoxious, that's all, and it looks fucking good. You know, the Sex Pistols wore swastikas because it was more of like an anti-establishment against the English, the English, you know, government at the time and the old guard, I guess. Um, it was more a reflection of that than anything else. I mean. The Homicides and Don's other band, The Rats, played heaps of shows with the Magoos, who were like Indonesian Muslims. It was a little bit of black humour um, to me. And then you'd see the other side of it, of people that actually couldn't see past the maybe black and white, couldn't see the grey area, and uh, they got offended by it. And it was effective. I've known Johnny for donkey's years. He's fucking nuts. He has the dumbest thing I've ever heard, but you've got this kind of whispers from one ear to the other, and because you've got these dudes doing this, um, like, you know, this, this kind of Magoo-style thing, you know, like, using that shit because it's offensive to people, and that's, like, a, a statement of intent, you know? We're going to, uh, like, offend people and sing about shocking shit because, you know, that, that expresses a certain, not a certain viewpoint, but a certain energy or a certain uh, attitude toward things. Man, the Magoos were the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen in my life. Um, I went to a Catholic primary school and a Catholic high school. At the time, I was in a Catholic high school. And it was just, everyone I knew <laughs> was white. I mean, just white, dumb, you know, Catholic white kids everywhere you looked, as far as my life was concerned. And I was, you know, I was rebelling against that and, and stuff. But when I, when I stumbled into the Heidi and saw the Magoos playing... We are the fucking Magoos. This song is again to all of you. Fucking white sin. It was like, you know, Osama bin Laden was there and he was basically, you know, looking down the microphone and telling me that I was, I was dead. That's it. Tonight, motherfucker, watch yourself. The Magoos are going to come for you in your sleep, you know? Um, and then, I, you know, years later I played for the Magoos. Oh, 
just they had a great one called Shut the Fuck Up, which was basically, you know, I guess a lot of these ideals like the, you know, you could say that uh, the society we live are based in of going, you know, look, this is this is all, you know, you, you say you want human rights, I say shut the fuck up. When you say women want to have abortion, I say shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up! And the in your face kind of thing, I think it works. People like remember our lyrics, people remember our offensiveness because like you know and if they know us, like you know, most of the people like you know people in the Magoose, it's just like any other like an you know, ordinary people. Like Rama, like you know, look at me, like I'm not even punk look like, you know. I'm look like an Asian just walking down the streets, you know, just like whatever, just like ordinary people. But I want to get a message called that ordinary people can get the anger out. Oh, and you know, a lot of uh, radical views, um, I don't know how much the dudes like, you know. But yeah, you know, I'm the drummer from the Magoos got raided by ASIO around all that terrorist bullshit. Back then, like, you know, I'm Muslim, so we are targeted, we are like profiled. And now two guys and two, two guys and two times come to, uh, to my place to get us interviewed. I was like, what's your opinion about September 11 and about the current attacks on Muslims and everything? And then I was like, no, I don't have anything to do with that. That's the kind of part of punk, you know, like it's inflammatory and, and the idea is to, you know, get people's attention. I mean, it, you know, when I first got there to the Heidi, I was, you know, I was angry and I was looking for other people who are angry. I mean, that sounds so naff saying that, but you know, let's call it, you know, call it what it was. And, um, you know, you go there and, you know, everyone is jumping around having a good time and they're uniting under this like, you know, common theme of, of you know, fuck everything else. So the music, it makes you like, it's your outer ego. It's your, you're like a superhero. I mean, I admit when, I, when I'm in stage, I'm a different person. It's just your outer ego. I don't even take anything, drugs, alcohol, I don't even smoke. Um, and then like, just come to the stage, it's just like you and your guitar, and it's just people like, you know, eagerly waiting for you. doing their thing and you know because they were so energetic and so into it and you know really wanting to put on a wicked show that you know every, like people just love the shit out of that even though they were hell rough around the edges the thing that was significant about Paul Higgins running the pub um, was that it was a community family atmosphere um, which sounds like it's a contradiction when we're talking about you know people with mohawks throwing themselves around and floors littered with glass and phone books ripped to shreds. Um, it sounds like it was, you know, a violent hellhole, but it, it actually wasn't. It was a pretty supportive atmosphere. A number of factors, I suppose. M mainly, um, you know, it was a big, big venue and it took a lot of, you know, money to turn on every day. Um, I suppose that was a bit of an issue, but, uh, you know, we got an offer from, from one of the big chains and if it wasn't us, it was going to be someone in the area, somewhere in the area, so that would have taken a lot of our bottle shop trade away, which would have made it pretty hard to, to sort of continue on how we were going, so we just sort of took that opportunity. It's a very hard one to take, but, you know. I was there the night that um, Higgins said, you know, that's it, it's, it's, it's over sort of thing. He, could, he'd, he sort of had a little speech, on, you know, he didn't jump up in the bar or anything. He just sort of yelled out to everyone, well, thanks very much, and um, the bar's open, guys, you know, and, like, he had to empty all the kegs. 
So it was just open bar. It was all on. It was like, you know, clear the kegs because Woolworths own the next one sort of thing. And so it ended up just being totally packed, totally raucous. I, I yeah, served a few other people and then walked back and just saw all these Woolworths people like in the office and at the stroke of 12 they were just taking over. You'd see them come in from the office and all the regulars and staff retreat to the back door with things in their hands trying to get the last swig of alcohol and the last cigarette. It was kind of surreal, it was like, because you know, they, it's not closed down, they're going to open it again, but you know it's not going to be the same. It's like the end of an era really. It went, to, went from free entry to, you know, pay as, as you go in. That, and, you know, and then the smoking laws and all these kind of things. And there's a number of contributing factors, which basically the clientele just went, no, oh, fuck this. You know, started, people started charging on the door. You know, you couldn't just drink as much as you want. Fucking pay went down. Everything went down. The, the, the crowds dropped by half when I even saw Within three hours of me talking to their insurance company, they sacked me after working there for 12 years. Um, so I've been working for Woolworths for two years, two and a half years, but working for the Higgins for 12 years. And yeah, I was sacked immediately and said, no, your services are no longer required. So off you go. I like the way that you look. I like the thing that you do with your hair. I like the record you play. That's a, a sweet music like the sound of your name. I like the place where you feel. I like the way you introduce me to Sam. Oh, mama, you understand, don't you now? I'm a drummer in a rock and roll. When it's happening to places you care about, fight. That'd be my message. When it's happening, fight. Because if you don't, they win easily. They win without a struggle, and then it becomes more likely that the same thing will happen again and again. Our spot, I mean, obviously we miss it. Miss it dearly. Some of it don't miss, but most of it really do miss. And um, I suppose to thank everyone over the years for, for supporting the Heidi and and for the kind words that you've said before that, that you know, it's just great. It's, it, it's uh, humbling to think people thought so much of the Hyde Park and, and uh, of the, uh, the staff and everyone involved with it. There are plenty of places for the higher end of the market to go to. And there aren't so many places for people more like me, of more modest means, with more unsophisticated tastes. To visit. And where are these like awesome bands, but they just don't have anywhere to play? Where are they going to go play now? Where, where are the great bands of the future going to come from? Because they're not going to come from the new Hyde Park Hotel. That's for damn sure.
glad the hottie closed down. Absolutely, I think it's great to close down. Because just the way it started, the way it started was because people were looking for somewhere to play and they made it happen and made it their own. That's why it became what it was. And then when it was closing, people were looking in money and they had nowhere to play and nowhere to learn their chops. Well, find somewhere else to play. That's what the Heidi spirit was, I think. You know? So, fuck you.